Haley, how do you pronounce your last name? It's Matsukawa. Matsukawa. Okay. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. It looks more intimidating than it is. <laughs> well, that's how I was like thinking it was, but I didn't want to assume. So. Totally. Welcome everyone joining. We're just gonna give it a couple of minutes because um, it's just noon right this moment and then we'll start. Thank you. I'm going to give it one more minute and then we'll start it. All right, it's 12.02. Um, I'm sure more people will be popping on as they remember. Um, so thank you for coming to our first meeting of the year of the Communications Collaborative Group.
I'm Becca Rubin, the, or Rebecca Rubin. I introduce myself both ways all the time. I'm the Public Outreach Coordinator um, at Soquel Creek Water District here in Santa Cruz County in Northern California. And this is our coordination team. We have Gina on the line with us today as well from Orange County Water District. And I think we're the only two from our coordination team today. A lot of people are traveling. So our agenda for today, um, we have Lost Virginist Pure Water Project, um, which I'm super excited um, to learn about and hear about, and as well as um, they did these pure water tasting events, um, which they, I've learned about them in the past and they're fantastic. So I can't wait for them to share um, their experience with you all. And then we have an update from Jennifer West of Water Use, Reuse California. And then if we have some time, our roundtable discussions and wrapping up. So with that, I am going to stop sharing the screen and turn it over to Haley Montes. See, now I'm gonna mess it up because I already, I tried to not mess you up. Haley Matsukawa and Ricky Clark. Um, welcome and thank you for um, being our spotlight today. I'm so excited. Yes, yeah, thank you for having us. Hi everyone, we can do some quick introductions. Uh, my name is Haley Matsukawa. I am with Water Systems Consulting and had the pleasure of working with the Lost Virgins Triumph Vogue JPA on a pure water tasting series. And my name is Ricky Clark. I'm a public affairs associate here at Lost Virgins in the Water District. And we're going to be talking a little bit about our pure water project and the pure water tasting series that we got to partner with WSB on. I will go ahead and get started. You can go ahead and advance the slide. All right. Thank you. So um, as this is a water reuse committee, I'm sure most of us are familiar with uh, indirect proposal reuse, but uh, for our specifically, for the Pure Water Project here in Las Vegas, we are doing um, a uh, surface water augmentation indirect potable reuse. Um, and initially, I mean, our emphasis was really uh, the situation in Malibu Creek. So we are located in the northwestern portion of Los Angeles County, so it's Calabasas, Hidden Hills, Agora Hills, and Westwood Village. Um, and within our service area here in Calabasas, we have you know, the famous Malibu Creek that actually runs right parallel with our uh, wastewater facility. And so um, it's very highly protected, very much regulated. And so there was essentially a water quality done in that creek, and uh, it found that our uh, recycled water that we were discharging into the creek when we had an excess of it in the winter um, had a little bit too many nutrients in it. So they gave us the um, ultimatum to either spend hundreds of millions of dollars to upgrade tapia so that the water that comes from our wastewater treatment process is actually higher than drinking water standards for humans, or we can cease discharging altogether by 2030. And so obviously, we're not going to spend that kind of money to continue to throw away drinking water into the creek that then leads to the ocean. So we decided to reinvest it in this pure water project and also create a new local supply of water. And so one other thing to note is that here in our region, we only have one source of water, and that's the imported water that we get from the state water project. Uh, we don't have any local water. We have very unique geology here that basically renders our water table and our aquifers here unusable. And so this project both satisfies that uh, watershed health and regulatory need, as well as brings us a new local supply of water. Um, also, obviously, it's going to make us more drought resilient as we will have more than one supply of water. So when one gets stressed, we'll be able to pull from another. From another. Um, and then, of course, just celebrating collaboration. This is really a regional project. This is a collaboration between Los Virginists and Triumpho uh, Water and Sanitation District, who makes up the JPA. We'll also be participating or collaborating with um, cities within our uh, service area, cities outside of our service area, as well as other um, water districts as we look for solutions for brine disposal. We can go ahead and go. Thank you. So for now, this kind of gives a nice look at the overall movement of water with this project included. So once we serve water to our customers' homes, it becomes wastewater. At that point, it'll go to tapia, where it'll undergo tertiary treatment and be turned into that high quality Title 22 recycled water. 
at that point, instead of being discharged into the creek or used for irrigation, we will then send it through the advanced purification process um, once we go full scale. And then we will be injecting that into our reservoir. That is the uh, reservoir augmentation that I mentioned. It also serves as an environmental buffer. Um, and then at that point, it'll mix, it'll pick up on all the minerals it needs to get fortified because it isn't within the environment, it'll go through less like filtration. Um, and then at that point, it'll be returned back to our community. So bringing water full circle um, is really sort of a tagline that we've been stuck with for years. Um, at the JPA, even before we were embarking on the pure water project, um, really maximizing beneficial reuse is what we're in the business of so that there are little to no waste products in what we do. Um, in addition to pure water and wastewater treatment, we also have a composting facility where we take the biosolids from that wastewater process um, and send it through an additional 30 day process to create space and very high grade compost that we then give away to the public. So, Again, just trying to close that sustainability loop and make sure that we're not surviving it. So um, the TMDL, or I guess the, the regulatory study, uh, stated that we don't have to be out of the peak until 2030. So it gives us obviously plenty of time to or plenty of time to find our alternatives and figure out what we're going to do with that um, recycled water and obviously build out the project. But in the meantime, the JPA made an investment in the demonstration facility here in Calabasas and the accompanying sustainability garden. And there are a few uses or a few purposes for each. Um, obviously, anything that costs money, you have to be able to justify and make sure that that money is being spent responsibly. And our staff wasted no time in um, convincing the board why having a demonstration phase was important. And so this demo facility is here at our headquarters, as I mentioned, and it serves three main purposes. First is for staff training. Uh, this facility is active and it is a scaled down version of the actual advanced purification process, which means that water is actively being treated here 24 seven. Um, this is giving our staff plenty of time as well as you know whatever consultants that we work with um, time to gain mastery of the technology, mastery of the infrastructure. We're doing challenge testing. Um, so when we're doing outreach, we're making sure that people know we're not testing to see if the technology is working. We know that it works. This has been used all around the world and up in space for many years. So we're really just getting our staff familiar with the technology and also solving for any specific challenges that come up for us while also testing out uh, materials from different manufacturers. So really trying to make sure that everything is optimized. Um, additionally, we have this facility for outreach and education. So we like to lead with transparency here at the GPA. Um, it's obviously very important, especially when you talk about recycling water for drinking water purposes. And so we have this facility open for tours and for events, and we invite the public, whether they're a customer or someone else, inside and in and all around to learn about what's happening, see the technology up close and personal, um, learn about it from either myself or our engineers or our operators, whoever they want to talk to, we all make ourselves available. Um, and then at the very end, if you can see that kitchen kind of to the right on that center photo, we host a tasting. So since the water is being actively treated inside the demonstration facility, we have uh, a tanking system in the back that stores the water so that we always have water available for tasting at the end of course. This is kind of, um, like the end all be all when it comes to building trust, right? I'm telling you if this works, I'm telling you what it is, what it isn't. Um, you can see the source water, you can see all of the technology. Now, let me taste the water with you and kind of build that trust so that they can see that it's safe, they can see what it looks like. Um, of course, since I lead the tours, I'm always doing the tasting with them. So um, I try to make sure that they get comfortable with that. And hopefully, you know, if they see me tasting, they're comfortable as well. And, at this point, we've had thousands of customers come through, and I've only had one person not taste the water. So I think that that speaks a lot to the effectiveness of outreach and why this uh, investment was worthy. Um, and then finally, uh, right outside and all around the actual demonstration facility, we also have a demonstration sustainability garden. And so here in the JPA's region, we had to uh, enact some pretty strict watering regulations. 
car went, the Metropolitan went down to another 30 slash here during the worst of the drought. And so we basically had to tell our customers that they had to let their lawns die. We only have that one source of water. We're state water project dependent. And so we were hit very hard um, by that water shortage. And so when you're telling customers that they have to let their lawns die, it helps a lot to be able to also present this as a resource to show them that, hey, maybe your lawn is something that you want to rethink with your landscaping. Maybe we can have something that's more climate appropriate um, and drought tolerant. That's also beautiful. You don't necessarily have to be married to a rock garden or a succulents and cacti if you don't want. So this garden contains several different sections with different kinds of plants and landscaping um, that show people that they have a variety of issues from when it comes to sustainable landscaping, including ground cover. If they were interested in something that looks like grass, for example, they have sclerophyllia. So really um, leading with education and offering ourselves and what we have here at the demonstration facility up as a resource so that we're not just telling our customers what they need to do, but that we're leading by an example and also providing them with a resource to help them do that. And so, as I mentioned, with this facility, we have been doing ongoing shows since 2020. We actually opened the facility with a virtual ribbon cutting. Obviously, we were in the throes of the pandemic. And so, when it was first opened, we were doing um, virtual tours. So, we actually recorded a tour um, in house. My counterpart, Stephen Baird, uh, does all of our video work. And so, I gave a tour, we recorded that, and posted it on our website and on YouTube for classes and students and teachers to use. We also offered first person live tours where I strapped a GoPro around my head and basically took whoever was tuned in via Zoom on a first person tour of the entire facility. So that was the alternative uh, during quarantine. And once those restrictions were lifted, we started uh, welcoming guests in. So this is an ongoing effort. Um, we do tours a couple of times a month and then more sometimes by request for the general public. I offer those tours both on the weekdays and on the weekends for those that work. So we'll usually do every other Saturday morning. And then if you have like retired groups or students, obviously schools, we do those tours during the week and uh, they just reach out to me to schedule or they can schedule online. And then probably the most fun part of outreach for this entire project so far has been our now award-winning Pure Water Tasting Series um, that I'm going to let Kaylee talk about. This is something that we partnered with WSD on, and it was executed flawlessly. I can't speak enough to how easy it was to work with her team and how well received this was by the public. It's one thing to give away free water and glasses at the end of the tour, but it's another thing to really make a dynamic and fun product to interact with that everyone loves, and then host a big event around it. And that's what Haley's team uh, sort of took the lead in helping us on. So. I'll let Haley keep going for the rest of it. Thanks, Ricky. And I should mention for everyone on the call, we will have plenty of time for questions. So if you want to learn more about the Pure Water Project um, or the tasting series, Ricky and I will be sticking around to address any questions. Um, and if you have not taken a tour with Ricky at the demonstration facility, definitely um, make time to do that. It's such an amazing tour. and. She's a real hero of the series. At some events, Ricky gave five tours in a row and we were like lining them up one group after the other. So definitely a collaborative process. Um, I will jump in. So as part of the tasting series, this is actually envisioned by the district. Um, as Ricky mentioned, the district was looking at creative ways to get more visitors out to the demonstration facility and engage in a bit of a fun way, apart from just tasting the pure water, we are exploring different ways to introduce the pure water into some fun products. Um, so the tasting series was made up of three events, a coffee tasting event, a gelato and sorbet tasting event, and then a beer tasting event. So I will work through all three of those quickly and just give the highlights and then, of course, available for questions. So our first um, event uh, for the series was the coffee event which was a really nice introduction um, to the series. Uh, the coffee event was hosted at the demonstration facility. I'll show some pictures in just a minute. We staged out front of the demonstration facility and then led tours in small groups 
uh, throughout the course of the event. So it was two hours that we were shooting for the morning. Um, and we had 145 people RSVP, 100 guests. Again, this is a bit of an experiment. We were trying to see what the interest was and, and really logistically how many tours we could squeeze into this uh, time frame. For our project partners, um, when we are looking at exploring how to leverage pure water into a coffee tasting event, we had interest in working with local partners. So in all the series, uh, the JPA definitely prioritized vendors that were in their service area, which is a little bit tricky um, and definitely limiting, but we're super happy that we we're able to accomplish that as there's tons of benefits of working with vendors that are part of the community, are learning about the project in some cases for the first time. Um, so we really cast a wide net to a lot of different partners, coffee vendors in the area, um, ultimately looking for a partner that aligned with the project values from a sustainability standpoint, and that logistically could work with us to produce coffee using the purified water. So the coffee event actually um, involved two different vendors. We worked with Calabasas Coffee Co., which is a, a small family owned business. Um, that did pour over coffee using purified water. So we were just producing the water on site. We had it uh, produced and kind of stored and essentially we were able just to transfer it right on site there to Calabasas Coffee Co. And they did a little bit of a pour over demonstration facility or demonstration and then were able to serve customers. And then we also worked with a vendor, Cappuccino Man. It's um, a remote cappuccino cart to make some specialty drinks, which is really fun. Uh, likewise, we just used purified water directly in the cappuccino machine on site. Um, this event also featured live music and breakfast and some food. And as I mentioned, as guests checked in for the event, they were assigned a tour number and we essentially rotated through um, about 25 people a group and Ricky would lead a tour it would last about half an hour and then we'd have the next group staged up ready to go. In terms of marketing, um, we did bill inserts to all of Los Virginis' direct customers. We had some ads placed in the local paper and then also a press release inviting media to attend the event. Um, we had an e-invite, so the district has an e-newsletter distribution list that we leveraged. Um, and then we developed postcards that were handed out at some of the events and tours that Ricky's been running throughout the year, along with social media. So you can see a little bit of the Brent Van event branding over there. And then just some highlights from the coffee event. Uh, super fun. This is the Calabasas Coffee Co. over here doing pour over drip. And you can see this is a special coffee cappuccino drink latte here and the cappuccino truck. Um, great attendance. Very hot, I will say. So we are really happy with the turnout. We are definitely battling weather. You can see all the events uh, were outside and then the tours were, were led inside here. We did some fun raffles and um, some other kind of entertaining things to encourage participation and, and get folks out there. So then our next event in August, things were even heating up even more, was the uh, Gelato event. And likewise, we explored a lot of different options in terms of how to use purified water to create ice cream, gelato, sorbet. Um, we even explored Italian ice or partnering with one of the ice trucks. And ultimately where we landed was a partnership with um, Tifa Chocolate and Gelato. This is definitely a community favorite, um, very, very popular gelato spot in uh, the district service area. And the way that this process worked in terms of creating the, what ended up being sorbet, because gelato leverages cream. So we had kind of like a vanilla flavored paired with uh, two different sorbets, a lemon and a aqua berry, what we called aqua berry, um, which is essentially a mixed berry, um, coordinated directly with the, with the restaurant's um, lead gelato maker. <laughs> and essentially coordinated over what the volume of water they needed to produce the amount of gelato we wanted to support roughly 250 guests. Um, so that was a bit of collaborative process, working through that science and those equations, making sure we are uh, leveraging the appropriate amount of water and working with our timeline from production standpoint. Um, we essentially delivered the water to the restaurant. They created all the products in house and then they actually included their staff to help serve at the event, which was a huge asset. 
Um, you can see this event was a little bit longer. It was held in the summertime. We really wanted to focus it on like family friendly, invite kids and youth and a bit of a different audience here. Uh, so we had a lot of fun features, face painting like music, carnival games, and then likewise, you can see we even bumped up. We had five tours going, uh, 380 people RCP and 250 guests. And we made it through 12 trays of gelato. Uh, the product tasted amazing and uh, definitely was a highlight for the year. I'll show a couple pictures there. And Ricky, jump in if there's anything that I missed related to the event. So yeah, you can see here, this is the chief of staff serving the gelato. This is all produced with purified water. Um, at each event, we have a short speaker, a board member from the JPA or staff to give a bit of introduction on the project. And then ultimately the guests learn a lot more on their tour with Ricky as well. So guests are invited to try the gelato before their tour, after their tour. It's really kind of an open house format for the event. And then our final event was uh, beer tasting, which I know maybe some of the folks on the call have uh, leveraged purified water to produce beer. We certainly learned a lot. Super fun to really dive into the science and the chemistry around uh, brewing beer. We also worked in outreach to essentially all of the microbreweries in the district service area um, to find a partner that could work with our timeline and had interest in the event and availability. Um, so we partnered with Lady Face Brewery um, and we really worked closely with their master brewer to develop a beer that would complement the profiles of the water. So we talked through the different limitations, obviously working with water that is has been run through RO and is extremely pure, um, lends itself to perhaps a lighter beer, like a pale ale is what ultimately we went with. We explored some different options and kind of slowly ruled out a lager, an IPA. Um, and we really wanted something that we didn't have to change the chemistry of the water too much, introduce minerals back into the water. We wanted to get as close to just leveraging the purified water out of the demonstration facility. Um, this ended up being a awesome partnership. This was the one event that was hosted not at the demonstration facility. So we hosted this at the restaurant. Um, and then essentially you can see the little tour tickets. We just hand out tour tickets and encourage folks to connect with Ricky to take a tour of the event at a later date. Um, we had, this is also RSVP only. It was a bit of a limited capacity because we were at the restaurant. So we had 150 guests. Um, lady Face brewed the beer and had a um, beer tender pouring for us. We poured 200 draft beers. And then part of the partnership that was really neat is they also agreed to can about another 250 beers. So that was really fun. We got to design a logo. We got to give out um, canned beers post event. And then obviously the district got to keep some for future events as well. And then another unique component of this partnership is in order to brew the beer, the minimum batch, just to do one batch was gonna be something like 11 kegs, way more beer than we were gonna need for a three hour event with 150 folks. Um, so Lady Face actually agreed to continue to serve the purified or our, our pure pale ale post event. So people from the community could go in and drink the pure water beer from the tap in the restaurant for a couple months following, uh, which we thought was a really nice addition and obviously an opportunity to engage with folks that maybe would never attend these events and or who weren't available, they could still go visit the restaurant and, and drink some of the purified beer post event. The beer turned out really amazing. Um, we had, again, sh on this event, we played a short video. We had some speakers, including the brewmaster, who had an opportunity to just talk a little bit about the nuances of working with purified water and, and obviously share his sentiment around the value of the project. And I think that's it for the events. If anyone has any questions, I see we have the Q&A. Um, we're excited to hear from the group and let us know. Oh, I can help with this answer. So Jen Short asked what process would go through to get regulatory permission to use water for these purposes. Um, so because our demonstration facility technically is not a water system, we are limited on how many tastings that we can do um, like per year. And so I actually have this here. I have to keep this sign up so <laughs> that, you know, tracking all of my tasting. Um, so there are two different ways that you can do this. Um, and then it's decided the way. 
um, they give you two uh, compliance tasks, basically. So one is you can limit the number of people to city per day to 25 maximum. And so that would be sort of the compliance path that you would want to take if you were just doing tours, right? But because we wanted to do these events, we would be using a larger volume to deliver to the uh, businesses for the, you know, the sorbet or the beer. And so we went with the second compliance path, um, and that's limiting the number of the days that we allow tasting. Um, so basically, if we limit the number of days for tasting to 60, um, that means that per day, that would be like 150 food per year, right, on average. So we went by averages. Um, and this is something a part of our SOP that we had prepared uh, for us by Brown and Caldwell. So this was, you know, something that we followed regulatory wise. Um, but yeah, that's the compliance path. So basically making sure that we didn't go over a certain number of cases for the year um, and averaging it out that way. Thank you, Ricky. Hope that answered it too. I just wanted to let everyone know I, I gave you all permission to unmute yourself. So if you have a question, mm -hmm. go ahead and unmute and just ask away all the attendees. Ricky, Thanks. is the is the SOP something that you can share with the group? So unfortunately it's not. I have had a question um, where we would be if if we could like share the SOP, but we're not able to, but you can reach out to the consultants to see if that's something that they could offer, like a service that they can offer. Um, we obviously paid them to do this for us, and so we can't just give away their work. Um, but I'd be happy to share any contacts that we have. That'd be great. Thanks. Ricky, Ricky I... thanks for that info. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'll wait. So, no problem. Okay, yes, yeah, sorry, um, Ricky, this is Jen Sword. I just, a follow-up question. Um, so, and maybe you you know the answer to this or not, but, um, you know, we had looked into doing something like this with our advanced treated water, and it seemed like at no point do you ever actually get kind of like a yes from the Department of Drinking Water. <laughs> like, they just kind of, they just say, you know, like, submit um, to us your your water quality for, you know, the week or month of, you know, that you're using that water. And then, so it's basically like you're reporting out to them, but they never give you any kind of ticket or certificate that says, yes, you're allowed to use this water for that purpose. Does that sound similar to your experience? You know, not really. And I would have to talk with our director, Joe, for that, because he, you know, him and then our chief treatment plant operators kind of, kind of handle the side for the Department of Drinking Water and, and regulatory in general. Um, so I can follow up with them, Jen, and then see how we went about that to make sure that we were in the booth for those. Okay, thanks. I'll circle back with you offline. Yeah. Thanks so much, Rick. And Jen, if, this is Gina from Orange County, if I may share, because we were trying to get permission, you know, we held a <clears throat> dedication event for the final completion of the groundwater replenishment system on, on the 14th of this month. We ran into the same thing that you're just talking about, Jen. We didn't get that official <laughs> email or sign off or permit. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we worked with um, our executive director of water quality in, in kind of coordination with the regulators. And what we had to do, because we bottle the water here the mm -hmm. you know the GWS water um we could only use that water that was bottled and already approved right by the state because every time we bottle we have to do water quality sampling and, and results and and they sign off on it so it ended up that that was the water we were able to mm -hmm. use we did like coffee lemonade iced tea um, but it was a challenging process for for us definitely mm -hmm. I see. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yes. And I, because I just realized, you know, without a solid yes, everyone felt really nervous over here to proceed. And so we haven't. <laughs> so, but thank you for sharing that, uh, your experience with me. Why don't we go to Jennifer and then um, Ricky and Haley? There is a, another question in the QA panel too after Jennifer's question. I just wanted to share on that regard. I remember when we had um, sampling at, for I think in um, a beer tasting event a while ago when, at our California conference. And it was very frustrating because we could not get a, it took a really long time to get a yes. And I think we actually got them forwarding a yes to the local health official, but never to us. So it was a little, it was very scary. And I'm sorry, you have to go through that. We tried to um, 
you know, it's just frustrating, but yes, everybody would like a clear yes before they proceed. Um, but oh, just a quick question on your um, uh, your your tertiary treated water you're using now for landscape irrigation, I understand. So is the idea then when the potable reuse project comes online that you're going to stop your landscape irrigation and all the and all the the lands and all of the recycled water will go towards potable reuse? No, so we are going to remain committed to providing that recycled water service to all of our um, recycled water customers, right? So golf courses, schools, parks, and like, stuff like that. Um, we have implemented a um, sort of like a drought factor. So basically requesting our recycled water customers to reduce their water use um, by 25%. That started in either last year or 2021. To basically start that process for getting that resource for the Pure Water Project. We're not going to go online until 2028, but just kind of timing our customers and getting them ready and letting them know, listen, this resource is really important for you. We're going to continue to provide this service, but we need to go save as much as possible and now start to use it more efficiently because we're going to need that for source water for this project. Now, in order to make sure that the full-scale facility will be able to run um, year round, we're not going to be able to just rely on our recycled water supply, partially because we're still going to provide it for um, irrigation purposes. So we're actually um, pursuing other source of water, um, some storm run runoff, pulling some wastewater from partnering cities um, next to us. So yeah, we'll have to get some more source water so that we can continue to provide that service. Thank you. Looks like there's some questions in, in the chat too. Um, how did you transport the purified water to the beer company for the event? And how did you manage the purified water usage during the event? So we uh, transported it a little bit differently for each one. So we had like five gallon jugs that we keep in our demonstration facility. Um, and so we had our operators um, basically pull the water and then I delivered it to um, the gelato place. And then I think the coffee place, they just used it once they got here. Mm -hmm. They needed a lot more water for the beer, obviously. And so we had to order big, like food safe 50 gallon drums for that one. Um, and I don't remember what the, um, Haley, do you remember the exact amount they requested? Yeah, I just pulled it up. It was around 250 gallons. Yeah. Uh, so we coordinated with the the brewery regarding what the best transfer method would be and ultimately landed yeah, on food grade um, drums. And so Ricky helped us coordinate that, getting it to the brewer. Yeah, so we ordered those and then had our operators fill them up and they also delivered it for us um, because obviously I can't put that in the back of my little car. So um, we filled, we ordered them, we filled them up and we delivered them. Great. And then another question, how did you approach each vendor with your event ideas? Yeah, I can take that one, Ricky, and jump in here. Um, for each event, we started with a brainstorm or a mapping with the district. So we sat down, we're like, who's our potential partners? Who do we want to work with in community? And as I mentioned, who's within the district service area, um, which was our main priority. And then from there, we developed essentially an invite or kind of a canned email that went out to all the vendors explaining the purpose of the project, orienting them to the purpose of the tasting series to uh, raise awareness for the project and demonstrate the quality of the water. Um, and then from there, we basically just kind of did one-on-one -on -one outreach to each vendor until we essentially landed on a vendor who is available, interested in partnering. Um, a lot of times from there, we would kind of phase two would be to bring the district in, we'd have a meeting with the vendors, and if it felt like the right fit and good alignment, um, we moved forward. I would say for Gelato, we had a pretty good idea that we wanted to partner with Tifa because we knew it was a community favorite, but for some of the others, the coffee and beer, it was definitely uh, began with mapping, and then we just went from there in terms of availability. The beer event was towards the end of the year, October, November, and so a lot of the breweries were doing their Oktoberfest and there are some other events going on. So I will say if you plan an event, take into consideration like seasonal availability, uh, but we are really grateful to land on Lady Faces, a partner who is also has a restaurant on site. So it made a perfect venue for the event. 
Great, thank you. There's one more question in the chat. If you received a no from DDW, is there any recourse to have the project reviewed again? Um, that might be a, a better question for some someone on the call that has received a no. We did not get a no. And additionally, we had consultants help us put together that SOP. And that was sort of our, our uh, guiding document to make sure that we were, you know, following all of the, the regulatory rules set up before us. And so um, I can potentially, I can probably share um, a screenshot of like our tasting requirements. And so I have this pulled up. I think I can put this somewhere in the chat. Um, but we did have a lot of help from the consultants. And so they made sure that we were not pulling from our non-water system too much. And that's where that, you know, 60 tastings a day or 25 a day, 152, you know, on average over the year came about. Um, so I would say utilizing a, a consultant or, or maybe just chatting with them to figure out how that was um, calculated. Any other questions? Guess not. Well, thank you both for taking the time today. Um, I was really impressed with it all. So it's awesome to hear. And the pure water tasting events looked so amazing. Um, and we want to copy you up here in Northern California eventually, once we have some water to produce. <laughs> okay, Thanks awesome. for having us. Yeah. I am going to share screen. And up next, we have Jennifer West from Waterways, California. Good morning, thank you for having me. Um, I'm just gonna be really quick today and give you um, a focus of what we're working on in the legislature and two key regulatory items. So one of the bills that's been, this is the beginning of a two year legislative session and we've just gone through the first policy committees. One of the key bills is we're looking at is SB 745 by Senator Cortese. And this bill is sponsored by the Pipe Trades Council it's backed by a host of environmental groups. Um, it's been, it was significantly amended a week ago, but at this point it requires the Building Standards Commission to develop and adopt mandatory, voluntary and mandatory building standards to install recycled water, gray water capture, on-site reuse facilities that include black water and potentially other alternative water sources. So this would potentially uh, well, this would apply to all new residential and commercial buildings. And it's the mandatory part of this that is particularly concerning. Um, obviously, we don't like to see any type of reuse mandated. Um, there's other components of the bill as well that have caused concern. You know, I'll just be honest, this is a very um, difficult bill because, you know, we like all these things, but we don't want to see them mandated, especially in areas where you know, Ricky's talking about and others where, you know, you, we have carefully planned out what the future projects are going to be for, um, you know, we have, we, we picked a lane potentially and are planning on potable reuse projects in the future. So there needs to be this coordination, not just potentially mandating that all new buildings have, have all of this. Um, so we are trying to, at this point, um, remove the mandate. This is incredibly difficult. It's, um, like I said, sponsored by um, a very influential labor union. And um, so just flagging this, um, uh, I, I think obvious things like mandating all new residential homes have a black water system, you know, that's probably going to come out, I'll just be honest, but some of the other parts, not so much. So our hope is that Maybe we can just get the reference to mandate out. Um, it would still allow the Building Standards Commission to to potentially do it, but at least we could get the mandate out. So that's that's one of our focuses. Um, next slide, please. So we're also working on funding in the legislature right now. We're defending recycled water funding in the state budget. There's two hundred and ten million dollars for potable reuse grants in the state budget as the governor uh, proposed it and one hundred ten million in grants for all types of recycled water. So we are working to try to keep that in there in the face of massive deficits. And our lobbyists testified yesterday with the chair of the state board 
um, were front and center um, saying, we need this. I was pleased that Chair Escobar um, was also strongly pushing back on discussions about, you know, cutting this part of the budget, but it is a huge budget deficit. So this is gonna be a huge challenge as well. Um, we are also looking to increase recycled water funding in two climate bonds that have been introduced for the 2024 budget. Um, both now include $300 million. We're asking for one point, um, $1.5 billion. Um, again, we had a good hearing this week where Assemblyman Garcia, one of the authors of this, bond, one of the authors of the bond indicated that he really did want to see um, increases specifically in recycled water. So these are big bond measures. They're 15 billion. We're not going to see any movement on this until next year. So we're right that now we're laying the foundation for a big increase in uh, recycled water funding. Um, next slide, please. So another part of the budget is a budget trailer bill that is being proposed by the Division of Water Quality. Um, it would create a new recycled water permitting fee. And this would allow Division of Water Quality to get authority to fund 19 new positions starting in 24 and 25. And most of those positions are going to go to the regional boards for all types of recycled water project permitting. There's four positions that will go to Division of Water Quality, and I think maybe one or two for DDW. Um, so this is um, a big ask. It's a lot of potentially a lot of funding. The Water Board is seeking through the budget process the authority to have to to create fee authority for them for this specific purpose. And then their idea is that they will work out the details in terms of how exactly this is going to land on disadvantaged communities or large projects versus small projects or complex versus non-complex projects in a stakeholder process in the spring. So um, we are asking at this point um, for a cap in the fee so it's not an open-ended ability to raise this fee every year if they receive the authority and to also provide a more transparent process when they do decide to increase the fee. Um, usually they just pick a number, put it in for, for other types of water quality fees. They pick a number, put it in the governor's budget. And at that point, it's very difficult to make any changes. So we have some ideas. Unfortunately, the water board doesn't like the idea of capping the fee. Um, they pushed back hard on that when we testified this week in committee on this issue and believe they should have an open-ended ability to raise this fee. Um, some years they may raise it, some years they may not. And if they go multiple years where they don't raise it, they want to make up for that. They don't want to have a fee that's tied to the consumer price index or anything like that, because they said in situations like COVID or something where they may decide not to raise a fee, then they, they're going to need to catch up. So we've got the water board opposed to any kind of even um, minimizing of this. So um, this is this is a real tough issue. We're going to keep pushing. Next um, next slide, please. So um, on the good news, we are in the final countdown for direct potable reuse. We're going to see a new draft in late May, potentially the first week of June. That's the latest from DDW as about two weeks ago. Um, and that will, it will start, the uh, Administrative Procedures Act will start when the release of that draft has come out. Now we've been working with DDW, uh, we have a recycled water we have, excuse me, a DPR working group that's been working on this with DDW since 2021. We've had many letters. We've had many communications. Um, just yesterday, I spoke again with board member Adamo um, specifically on our outstanding concerns on this. Um, so I, I want to just um, flag that, you know, we're going to see this latest draft, but there has been a lot of communication. Now, the latest draft I understand it's taking so long because the lawyers are going through each section by section to make sure they haven't missed anything. Um, once they release that draft, as I said, it'll start the former AP, uh, um, Administrative Procedures Act process. Then there are, they've added in some additional time for comments if there needs to be an additional um, public comment period. We're going to need the expert panel to come back and say and deem that these regulations are in fact still protective of public health. We expect the water board will vote on the final regulations in their second meeting in December. So they won't go on an early break. They've um, been informed that that second um, Tuesday of the month in December will be the DPR final vote. Then the spring, um, the Office of Administrative Law 
has until a couple months to approve the final regulations. They just make sure that they're consistent with the statute and there's nothing um, nothing inconsistent there. Once they're published, they're formal and we're done. And this is after working on this intensely for 13 years since the Pavley bill came out in 2010. So this is exciting year for this. Um, I think we've made a lot of progress. Um, there's a couple areas where we're really pushing still. We want to expand the alternatives clause. This is a clause that was in both the groundwater and the surface water augmentation regulations. This allows, right now it only applies to the chemical control section of the regulations. We want it to apply like the previous regulations to the entire section, uh, to the entire DPR regulations. And this will allow us a lot more flexibility in the future to have a demonstration that a certain certain component of the regulations um, can work without um, a certain component that um, that an agency can go a little bit outside the regulations. They first have to talk to DDW if this if they even want to see a demonstration that this is possible. Then the agency would have to demonstrate that some aspect of the regulations could be changed. They would have to do an independent advisory panel to to confirm that those regulations, um, that, that what they're proposing as an alternative to the regulations is safe. And finally, DDW would have to confirm that this would, that they are comfortable with that. So there's a huge process involved. Um, it's not just um, any anything you wanna do. Um, and DDW fully has control to say no at any point, but they're still not interested in a broad alternatives clause. They, they think chemical control should be enough. And um, this is really difficult because I think without this, we're going to need to see the DPR regulations be revised a lot more than they would otherwise. Um, so we're going to keep pushing for this. And we think, you know, as again, it was it was adopted twice and pa unanimously passed twice by the Water Board. As part of that, they did a statement of reasons of why they need it, um, the Water Board itself. So I've been quoting the Water Board themselves since 2017 on why they need this. So this is difficult to understand why they're pushing back on this quite as much as they are. Another major point we're making is that we want to have one water board panel, an expert panel at the water board, make recommendations for all CEC monitoring. Right now, the regulations have the DIPRA or the organization, the group of agencies doing DPR making or the, the agency in charge is um, they're going to have to do a quantitative risk assessment for CECs. We think this is going to create a lot of um, chaos and confusion and inconsistencies across California. Frankly, we know that the Water Board is interested in doing this. There's no funding for this now, but we're hoping that this, this concept gets into the regulations. And then Water Reefs California commits to helping fund this, having one Water Board panel for this purpose, and we will help support this through the budget and so forth. There's other major components that we push back on, but this, these are the two that I think are gonna come down to critical uh, focus. So I think I have one more slide. If you could pass, thanks. So the other major regulatory package going through that will also be released in May is making conservation a way of life. This was legislation that was passed in 2017, I believe, um, <clears throat> and we've been working on this for years. And these are <clears throat> how you continue to, in the framework of all conservation, make sure that recycled water is part of that. That was, it was included in the original legislation. So we have regulations. Um, we have a proposal now at the Water Board, which is consistent with DPR, the framework that um, for irrigation, um, they uh, it will be allowed to use uh, recycled water at 1.0 ETO, for all recycled water landscape irrigation. Right now they have a carve out for non-functional turf. Um, I'm not sure that's gonna stay in there or not. We, we shall see, but we are pushing back. We think it should, that the legislation said nothing about non-functional turf. So that's one of our positions is um, 1.0. And, and we think that this is, this is in fact will be in, it's in the framework. We believe that it will move forward provide the full potable reuse credit that was also included in the DWR recommendations to the water board, um, provide a, uh, a variance for high TDS recycled water and an additional variance or process for agencies that are close to their permit limit, but then for, for TDS, but might go over their permit limit if the indoor water use is lowered. 
we are in the process of working on that last issue. So this is, um, so I guess what I'm saying is we're, we, we're in pretty good shape on all of these uh, items. Um, as I said, we have that non-functional turf um, issue, but otherwise I think that we are, the years of working on this issue um, with DWR, years of doing specific studies on this and all this um, that we are, we are in, you know, as a do no harm as good as, as we can be in this situation. So I'm, I'm actually very proud on how we're positioned moving into the final stages of the regulations on this. Um, and I believe, oh, one more slide after that, just a call and letting everybody know that the call for abstracts is going to go out next week for our conference, which will be held in Indian Wells from November 5th through the 7th. We're very excited about the conference. Um, well, sponsorships are also available now. We've sent that out for the agencies interested. Um, John Robinson, he's our, still our conference uh, sponsorship chair. He'll be reaching out to agencies. Um, again, encourage this committee to submit an abstract for a panel or a technical session. Um, that, like I said, that is going to be coming out next week. So really want to encourage people to engage and be involved in this. We're also, as part of this, going to have a charity golf tournament with the proceeds going to the Bauman and Chic Scholarship Fund that we established um, for um, at UC Davis for students interested in water. So we're really excited about that. The charity golf tournament will happen Sunday morning um, before the conference really gets big time underway. And we really encourage your agencies to get involved and to be, um, to engage in both. So I, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Feel free to unmute yourself or type in the Q&A box as well. But we'll have a lot to send out in May with DPR and making conservation a right way of life. For sure. Thank a busy so May is in store. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like it. Yes. Well, thank you for the update. Really appreciate it. I think we are now to roundtable discussion with Gina. Great, thank you, Becca, and um, good afternoon, everyone. So now is an opportunity just for, for the group to hear from you whether or not you have ideas for future meetings, future spotlights um, for our next meeting, which I believe Becca will be in August. Am I correct? Okay. Um, yeah, and or anything that you want to share with the group, whether or not you've had um, kind of successes or challenges with different projects or programs that you're trying to highlight for water reuse education, um, it would be great to hear from anyone. So please feel free to put it in the chat or unmute yourselves. And um, I think while everyone is thinking to give everyone a moment, um, I can share a, a recent, um, we're very excited at the Orange County Water District. We had the opportunity to commemorate um, our final completion of the groundwater replenishment system. So we're producing 130 million gallons a day, enough for a million people. So that was a, a project decades in the making. So we came together on April 14th and had a great um, event to celebrate that. Um, so we, we have had, um, a lot of media success to go along with that. And, and one of them recently, um, our executive director of engineering and operations, Mehul Patel, who I'm sure many of you have seen and, and heard from, um, he was he was in a PBS um, segment or a segment that aired, excuse me, on PBS. It was Nova, the the popular science show. And so I'll put in the in the chat a link um, it was uh, one of five kind of programs featured in the segment. And then as a follow up to that, just this morning, uh, we were we were contacted due to a virtual, sorry, having trouble speaking this morning, a virtual field trip. Um, and so NOVA, they have kind of a, a virtual extension of their outreach and education. And they broadcast the field trip to um, all over the U.S. to middle and high school students. So it was cool. We had Mayhol hop on Zoom in a conference room and and we put together a presentation for him and had kind of cutaways that, that he could show folks. And there was live Q&A with students and teachers. So I will put it in the chat. Both the field trip um, is available to view. We just had that this morning um, and um, as well as the, the segment that aired on NOVA. So 
in case you're interested or, or want to use that as a resource. Hey, congrat congratulations, Gina. I, I've heard that the event was really, really wonderful. A lot of people showed up. Uh, in, in fact, I know Patsy was there. She could probably even say more. Thank you, Mark. Yes, Patsy was there and, and, and it was a, a great event. It really was. Um, I mean, it's it's so uh, groundbreaking what you all have done, and uh, the event really showcased that as well as included lots of people. How many people did you have? It was crowded. I know that. We had about a 350 people. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it, it was great. A great turnout, a great event. Thank you. Gina, I am going to... Um... Our colleagues in Australia actually reached out to um, myself and um, Rupalm last week asking if anyone had exit or entry and exit questions from their learning center experiences. So I'm going to pop her email into the chat box. Um, and if anyone has surveys they would they feel like they can share with them, they would really appreciate it. And I'm sorry, what, what type of data was Danielle looking for? So she was looking for um, entry and exit survey questions at, for, their, for your visitor center. So they're trying to do a pre and post survey. So before they enter a visitor center and then the post survey after. Okay. So if anyone has something like that, she would appreciate um, sharing. I've sent her hours. And so I'm guessing some of you out there have some, maybe not. Hopefully, good data to collect. Nobody, nobody has any ideas? Roundtable discussion or topics they want to discuss in a future meeting? Or even if you want to, if you have like some issues, we can help, you know, problem solve and have a chat. Because after this, we're, we're done. OK. Well, thank you all for coming. Our next meeting is August 24th. Um, and we're going to do our best to also um, have something at Water Reuse um, in November. So have a great rest of your day. And always, you can email us. Um, I'll put my email and chat as well. Um, if you have ideas that come to you afterward, um, we're, we'd love to hear them. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Becca. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.